right, it's going to be a fun, fun worship time. Last night on the lake, I got the speaker system all set up on the pontoon, and these, well, I'm not making this up, but I'm saying this sarcastically, these water skiers went by. <laughs> yeah, and they created a wave, knocked the speaker system over. This is not David's fault, but my iPod needs to be reset, and it's not going to happen right before a sermon because it takes a long time. So David's already ahead of me. You're on, David, and thank you much. I'll reset it after this service. And saying all that, I'm talking about showing gratitude and appreciation today. How do we show our gratitude? How do we show our appreciation? And Jesus says, blessed are those who thirst for righteousness. They begin to understand mercy. Let's just pray about that. Gracious Lord, we can try to get all the electronics we want right. But in the end, it's all about you. Electronics are a tool to help your love be displayed. But nothing replaces your salvation. As we look at our gratitude for righteousness, open us up to think about that, Holy Spirit. As we dig a little deeper with Carrie's help and my help, Lord, just open us up to the will and the challenge, by grace, not guilt, of the Holy Spirit. And let the words of myself and Carrie, Lord, let it be your word. Humbly, but with gratitude and expectation, let us hear you in Jesus' name. Amen. The righteous will be filled with mercy. And as we do that, the first thing I want to look at is gratitude. How do we express what it means to be appreciated? How do we express our gratitude? That's very hard to do. I mean, often we find people that just, they don't get it, do they? We're walking across the parking lot, and there's a pop can down there, and walk right by, I didn't drop it, I'm not picking, you know, all of that. But people do express gratitude. It's easy to find if we start looking around. Yesterday, we were out on the lake. And we were right by, they don't even know I'm going to say this, Marsha Herzberg and Diane Fuchs' dock. And it was near lunch, and I was hungry, and I asked them to bring me a pizza. And they didn't do that. <laughs> you didn't know you were going to be the part of the sermon, did you? And Bruce, he didn't even come out. He was taking a nap. He didn't even come out. <laughs> but in seriousness, when you look at how we express gratitude, I want to share a story of a college student. I don't know his name, I've never met him, it went on the news, is how I got it. He's a college student, he's gonna be a junior at a college in the southeast part of the United States. He was home with his summer job, and in the midst of his summer job, early June, he got it. Sunday afternoon, maybe you heard about this, his car broke down. Typical of a college student, right, Carrie? Probably driving a Pinto or something like that. And he was in a smaller town, so he didn't have the ability to get his car fixed that afternoon. He had to be at work his first day on the job the next morning. He got up at 3 a.m. in the morning to walk to work so he could get there five minutes before 8 or 10 minutes before 8 a.m. when he was going to start his job. Now, needless to say, his boss... Gave him a ride home that day. <laughs> and by the, a few weeks later, his boss gave him a slightly used car, but a good car, to finish out his college. Gratitude. How do we show that gratitude? Because if we really, really are appreciative, <coughs> excuse me, of what Christ did for us, if we really appreciate the righteousness that Christ did for us, then we express that through the attitudes we develop of Christ in our life. 
When I had my first appointment, some of you have heard this, Southeast Minnesota, Wyckoff and Fountain, Minnesota, Fillmore County. I got there and I wanted to help in the community right away, and I really did. And so I went down to the local middle school right in the town of Wyckoff. And I wanted to help young people. And I knew that I could help them uh, in many ways. So I went to the principal's office. I told her I was the new pastor. She wanted to make sure. She thought I was about 13 years old the way I looked. Anyway, she wanted to make sure. And I said, I want to help. At first, I'm not making this up, she was a little thrown off. She said, I don't have money to pay you, Pastor, in the budget. I just want to do it voluntarily. And she was a little thrown off. She said, who does that? After a while, I started working in the weight room with the football players, and she realized that I just wanted to help. After a few years, she just always told me, I'm so grateful for the way you help because of your witness for Christ. Six years later, I left that church, went to Litchfield, and she gave me a note, and she donated a large sum of money to Minnesota Adult Teen Challenge, because I worked with them down there too, in my name. How do we appreciate righteousness? How do we do that? Well, if we're going to get to the attitudes of Christ, the first thing we need to do is understand verse 6 and righteousness. What does that mean? Why should we even appreciate it? And we need to go back before the verse. We even need to go back in our heads and our minds. Let the verse be up there. We need to go back in our heads and our minds and think, I'm a born again Christian. I know what it means to live forever. I know what it means to be saved by grace. I know what it means to hear the words, you're worthy in spite of everything we do. And what does that mean? It means that we understand, and I know there's not a cross up here. The cross is getting fixed. But we understand what it means to get up in the morning and get out of bed and know I'm saved by grace. And, and the reason I know that is I have this visual of a son of God who stood with his father. And they looked and they said, well, the flood didn't really do it. We can't do that again. That didn't work. Are you willing to go down, down to earth and are you willing to, to leave your godly powers behind? Are you willing to have the emotions of a human? Are you willing to get beaten by the Roman governor? Are you willing to get nailed to a cross? And are you willing to look at candles and say, Father, forgive him because he doesn't know what he's doing. And then you think, well, that's a lot right there. I mean, that's grace. Oh, wait, there's more. Are you willing to get up on Easter morning and tell the ladies, I'm alive, and because I live, you live also. You and I, we've been made right because Jesus Christ said, I love you that much. And because of that, do we want to hunger and thirst for the righteousness that God... I'm not talking about an earthly level of righteousness. That's not bad. I meet people that are nice all the time. But I'm talking about thirsting righteousness because I know what salvation is. In spite of everything that I've done, all the mud in my life, I've been cleaned. And I want to thirst for righteousness. You know... In all 50 states, I looked this up there, you probably know this, a good Samaritan law. Every single state has a good Samaritan law. I find that kind of interesting that they call it a good Samaritan law, but that's another message. But every single state has a good Samaritan law. In Minnesota, the good Samaritan law is if you're walking, you and I are walking by someone that needs help, we are liable if we choose to ignore the help they need, we're liable to a $300 fine or a misdemeanor. It's interesting, the law's never been enforced, but hey, we have a good Samaritan law. The world already knows what it means to want to make things right. But as Christians, Jesus is saying from that hill, when he took those people out and he gave them that sermon on the mount, and he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. He's saying, do you want to, do you want to seek the righteousness of Jesus? That's why things like Minnesota Adult Teen Challenge come alive. That's a Christian organization. 
That's why Youth for Christ out of Wilmer comes alive. That's why somebody at some point uh, uh, years ago decided that that land out on the south side of Turtle Bay should be donated to the Evangelical United Brethren Church at the time and start a Christian camp that we know as Corona's Assembly because they thirst, whoever donated that land, thirst for righteousness. And they allowed me to find Christ. When I asked Jesus into my heart at Hillside Dorm and later sealed it on the old, what, is, what used to be the tabernacle. That's why people thirst for righteousness. Because they want people to see Jesus. And if that is the case, we begin to understand mercy. I'll ask for that verse, that mercy verse. If I know what it means to be made right, because I understand, not all of it, but I get what it means to be saved by grace. I get, and the cross will be back, but I get what it means to be saved by grace. I get what it means to have salvation. And I get what it means that if it wasn't for Jesus, I wouldn't even breathe. Then I start understanding mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive them. I'm not saying we're going to go out and, and be the best person all the time. I get that. I wake up some mornings and I'm worse than the bear that should be. Right? Or I end up watching the news and when I shouldn't, and my mood goes south fast because I watch politics. I'm not the best person all the time. Neither are you. I've met some of you. You're fun to be with sometimes. <laughs> But when we get into the moments of the Holy Spirit, when we find those sweet spots, you know, when a golfer hits that driver and that sound, that, that little hum goes, and that means that the driver hit the sweet spot. When we get the sweet spot of life, we start understanding mercy, don't we? We start understanding righteousness. Yesterday, Carrie put together a lake day for us. For all the youth. And we were out on the water and I, I got up with Peyton and Lily Smith and we were out there behind the boat, the three of us together. It was a great day to be a pastor. The sweet spot of mercy. The sweet spot of saying, Lord, I'm born again and I am grateful because this is mercy. As you know, my mother passed away, and I just happened to be, which I'm grateful because I was going in and out of that hospice room from time to time. But I was there when she breathed her last. And my sister was there, my son was there. Kelly came in a little later. She was at the U Zone, but she don't, Kelly has given her life to my mother. And. I just, in the midst of that pain, I just said, mercy. She's alive. Because I'm a Christian. I know she's a Christian. She introduced me to Christ. And because of that, blessed are the righteousness. They start thirsting for others to have righteousness. Blessed are the mercy. Folks, we get to understand a little bit today about what it means to take that statement over there, our mission statement, to introduce people to Christ, help them grow in Christ. We get to understand, if we want to be righteous, what it means to do that. What it means to be merciful. What it means to be Jesus with skin on. And because of that, we get to see that opportunity. As I go to introduce Carrie Heff, I want to do it in this way. Carrie has been at St. Ben's for, for four years, five years, right? Four, four years. Okay, you did it. Wow. You did a college degree in four years? Two of them? Wow. Man, I got to introduce you to a lot of college students. Anyway. <laughs> And, and she's going to go on a, a, a mission called Culture Project. This is the best part, by the way. This is where I smile at Bill and Nancy Heff. Happened to be on vacation this week. Um, she graduates from college. And you know how you graduate from college and you should get that college job with that salary and everything? She graduates from college. She's going to raise her own support. <laughs> <laughs> 
So she's going to talk about that because she wants to be in mission. As I say that, uh, one of the great preachers that I often study, I've read a lot of his books, uh, Dr. Charles or Chuck Swindoll. He eventually became the president of the provost of Dallas Theological Seminary down in Dallas, Fort Worth, but he's a great preacher. His brother was a full-time missionary. And Pastor Chuck, or Dr. Swindoll, talks about a time when uh, Charles' brother and him were all home for Thanksgiving one year. His brother was coming home from Mexico, was heading back there for a lifelong mission they have. And they got to the table, and Chuck's dad looked at his brother, who's a missionary, and said, Are you doing okay? Do you have enough money? This is early in the 70s. And Charles says his brother took out a, a nickel. His dad was being serious. Threw it on the table. And said, right now that's all I got, Dad. And then he smiled with joy. Isn't it great to see what God's going to do with that nickel? Carrie's doing a thing called the Culture Project. And yes, she's going to ask you for your money. <laughs> Not today, but if you have that opportunity, she's going to talk about that. And then she's going to gift us with music. Carrie, I think this is your mic, if I'm not mistaken. I'm going to go down here where I can hear you. Good morning. Good morning. So again, my name is Carrie Heft. I'm from right here in Painesville. I'm Bill and Nancy's third oldest. And um, I just graduated from St. Ben St. John's, graduated from Painesville in 2014. And I'm out to spend a year as a missionary with the Culture Project. And when I say culture, you might be wondering, well, what am I, what am I exactly referring to here? And uh, I'll just dive right into just a little piece of this culture. Our culture is a culture in which four out of ten children are born without married parents. Nearly half of all teens have had sex, yet casual sex is associated with psychological distress and depression. A culture where before the age of 18, 9 out of 10 boys and 6 out of 10 girls will be exposed to pornography. Nearly half of all pregnancies are unintended, and a fifth of all pregnancies ends in abortion. And I don't know about you, but this isn't exactly a culture that I want to be living in. Uh, a world that it doles out cheap counterfeits of love and disguises it as happiness. That tells us that our worth is found not in being children of God, but in what we have or in what we do. Uh, in a world in which it's considered a right to eliminate unborn children at our own convenience. And it turns out that I'm not the only one who's been a little disappointed and fed up with this culture. And in 2014, a group of college students actually... I decided that really this all comes down to an identity crisis, that we as humans have forgotten who we are and what we're made for. So they created the Culture Project. And um, the Culture Project is an initiative of young people that set out to restore our culture through an experience of virtue, inviting what is sometimes called the culture of death to instead come alive through messages of human dignity and sexual integrity. So as a Culture Project missionary, I'll be living in community with a team of four other young Christians. We'll have teams throughout the United States, and we'll go up to schools and parishes, college campuses, uh, wherever we're asked to go as speakers. First getting to know the youth, and then sharing with them this message of authentic life and love, which seems to be countercultural in our world today. And we also speak to parents, helping them understand the environment that their children are growing up in and how to help them know how to speak to their children about these issues and to help them navigate our culture. I will also be active in the pro-life movement, and we do a lot on social media and uh, bringing these messages through engaging videos and blogs and pictures on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and on our website. So um, at this point, you might be wondering how crazy someone has to be to go head to head with this culture, with pornography and human trafficking, hookup culture, sexting, abortion, and the list goes on. And I guess I would say as crazy as I am, <laughs> but uh, I'd also say that we're all called to fight this fight, to do something about this culture, though we're not all called in the same ways. 
And that's why I'm here today. I want to invite you to enter into this mission with me, both spiritually and financially, to remind the world who we are and what we're made for. And the answer, by the way, is children made in the image and likeness of our God, made to and for love, the same love that the Father has for us. And as missionaries, we treat our work as a real job, paying any other bills that any working citizen has to pay, has to pay because this work is both necessary and it is crucial. So in the same way that pastors and priests and other church staff are supported by the community, we also go out to the community for our support. So I'm spending my entire summer meeting one-on-one -on -one with individuals and couples and families and creating a team of spiritual and financial warriors, if you will, because the Lord knows I cannot do this work alone. So there are actually contact cards and each of your pews. There might be a few in the back. I wasn't expecting the back to be so full, but I have extras in all the pews and outside. Uh, so you can take those uh, at this time and you can just briefly fill out your information. There's pencils in the pews and um, fill out your information. And I'll let you know that there's no obligation to give financially by filling out these cards, but this will allow me to reach out to you individually and to tell you more about the mission and invite you to at least be praying for me and let me know how I can be praying for you throughout my year. And I'll also be sending out monthly newsletters, letting you know what's going on in the mission, maybe a really a glory story from the classroom or some challenges, how you can be praying for me. And uh, really just keeping you in the loop with this mission that we're all in together. I would love to bring another maybe 20 or so individuals and families into the mission from here at Grace United Methodist. And just so you know, your support will be tax deductible. Uh, so after service, I'll be outside after I've finished the postlude uh, to talk with you and answer any questions you have, tell you more about the mission, and uh, you can either hand the forms to me or you can leave them right there in the pews and I will pick them up. And I'll also have written materials about the Culture Project and my own business card that you can take with you, check out their online resources. And um, yes, this is the Culture Project International. So in closing, as I'm sure you know, our world is deeply in need of a countercultural message of real love and authentic life and of dignity and ultimately of true joy and fulfillment. And uh, I know this is really a message I wish I would have heard more of when I was growing up. So uh, thank you for allowing me to take a few minutes of your time and uh, for your prayers and for your support and for joining this movement to bring our culture back to life. Uh, and with that, um, jumping off of pastor's sermon today, uh, I have a song called Mercy, Mercy. It's by PJ Anderson. So I just invite you to enter into worship with me. Your mercy is the calm in my 
Joy is there.